The story begins by introducing us to the world of Wise Loon. This is a place where both humans as well as demi-humans live with each other. We are then shown the Palace of Wisdom, which happens to be the top knowledge hub in the human kingdom of Alexa. Sadly, there are no home deliveries in this place as we see bandits attacking innocent people in full flow. Some religious men are getting targeted, so they wonder where the palace knights are to rescue them. It seems that these knights do not have the best reputation in this world, as the religious men curse them for being useless at such a crucial moment. They take a look at the flag being flaunted by the bandits and realize that it is of the mercenary group known as Irwin. This group is led by a dangerous demon girl named Merida, who also happens to be curvy and attractive. The Irwin group is the strongest and most evil mercenary group of the entire demon race, so it looks like these people are doomed. Suddenly, Merida notices a boy standing in the corner and doing nothing so she gets interested. This boy is none other than our hero Albert, who for some reason has been kept as a prisoner. Merida confronts him but in a friendly way and confirms that he is indeed the treasured gem of wisdom. She says that he has a cute face and nice body, which means that Merida is no stranger to intrusive thoughts. As Albert wonders why he has been put in such a sensitive position in front of such a curvy babe, he tells Merida that he has been expecting her. Now, it's time for some backstory to understand our hero. In the kingdom of Alexa, Albert was appointed as the youngest priest ever. However, it turns out that he was reincarnated from another world, so he retains the memories of his past life from Japan. His name from his past life was Hayakuki Kotaro, and he had lost his life at the meager age of 32. Since Albert already had these many years of knowledge with him, it did not take long for him to be known as the treasured gem of wisdom over here. It turns out that when he got reincarnated, Albert was given a skill which could help him see the numerical potential of others like a stat bar. This also includes the three main sizes of curvy babes. Due to this skill and his genius, Albert was quickly recognized by the king and became his favorite. However, his happy days met a swift end when he got punished for a grave offense that he had committed. This offense was committed towards a prince named Orgis, and the royal palace carried out the punishment immediately. Albert was quickly demoted to a trainee priest, and then he was told to carry out missionary work. Of course, our hero had no other choice but to accept this punishment, and then he was scolded heavily by the churchmen we had seen earlier getting attacked. Then, we see Prince Orgis himself, who mocked our hero for being such a fool despite being known as the Gem of Wisdom. We also see his stats, which are not at all impressive, especially if you consider Sung Jin Wu as your standard. However, Orgis happens to be the first in line to the throne, and then we see Albert commenting on how terrible his stats are. We also learn that Orgis is known as the foolish prince who only uses his name and authority to his undue advantage. Albert explains that the prince was known to corrupt the children of established lords so that he could use them to kidnap cute girls from the countryside. These girls would then be pushed to work at shady places within the kingdom's capital. Around six months ago, one of Albert's slaves was about to be pushed into this horrible racket as well. Due to this, he tried to inform the king, but the head priest of the church tore up his appeal and informed Orgis about it. Of course, they took no responsibility for the whole thing, so now it does not feel so bad to have seen them getting attacked by Merida. The head priest even bribed the prince into sparing the church, which was a shady, but wise move on his part. Orgis then asked Albert about his slave girl and where she was, because he had heard that she was both curvy and cute, a combination that is in high demand on comic guzzlers. Albert said that he had given her a few days off, so the prince became disappointed. He then told our hero to be careful during his missionary work, 
because the frontier he was being sent to was known for being attacked by bandits. The head priest continued to act like a suck-up to the prince, and then he told his men to keep Albert tied up. Now that we understand how our hero got here, it's time to go back to the present where he is in front of some massive pillows. Merida happens to have heard something from Albert's messenger, and this is why she has brought her army here to recruit him as her key strategist. Merida might be known as the most powerful demi-human warrior from the Demon Empire, but now she suddenly looks cute. Our hero takes a look at her stats, all of which are supreme level, but there are two stats that stand out the most. The first one is G-Cup, which is impressive in any universe, and the second one is that she is 18 years old. Keeping this in mind, Albert has no legal obligations towards us anymore and is free to engage in his intrusive thoughts. Of course, there are some weaknesses in her stats, such as intelligence and domestic affairs, but that is exactly where Albert will come in to help her. Merida wants to know what our hero is staring at, but he simply acts as if he is being taken as a prisoner. That shady face isn't fooling anyone, though. So he explains to the demon girl that if she kidnaps him in front of everyone here, it means that he can leave freely without having to tie up any loose ends. Merida understands his strategy, so she picks up and prepares to leave, as she does not wish to engage with the human army right now. Albert continues to act as if he is being kidnapped, and then everyone escapes from the frontier. Now, we move to the mercenary group's base of operations where Albert is settling in. A girl calls out to him, and we learn that it is his slave girl, Alicia. She is wearing a rather outstanding maid outfit, so our hero asks her why she is dressed this way. She says that it is a way to keep him safe, and then we learn that she is the one who managed to arrange for Albert's escape by acting as his messenger for Merida. The maid girl thanks her lord for saving her life, because if he had not sent her away, then she would have been kidnapped into the massive racket that Prince Orgis is running. Her stats are also amazing as she possesses the powers of H-Cup, which is even better than Merida. The demon girl shows up and asks Albert if Alicia is looking good in a maid outfit, so it means she was the one who wanted to see Alicia this way. It looks like both Albert and Merida have the same tastes when it comes to women and their costumes, so they will most definitely get along well. Merida wants to get a bit too comfortable with Alicia, so Albert tells her to calm down as the maid girl is his confidant. The demon girl then says that our hero has no need to worry, as she has not tried out Alicia just yet. This means that Merida is interested in cute girls and curvy babes, just like most men of culture. She then moves towards Albert and says that she would not mind trying him either, which means that she likes playing for both teams. She proceeds to throw him into the bed, and he gets a bit worried, although most men would jump into the bed themselves. Now, the demon girl says that she had originally intended to just use Albert for his wisdom, but she also likes the way he looks. On top of that, he also has a calm demeanor which makes him very mature for his age. The most important thing for Merida, though, is that Albert smells amazing which is more than enough to awaken her inner beast. Alicia agrees with this sentiment, so it looks like Albert is going to experience the heaven that most men dream of. Merida proceeds to say that she deserves to sample Albert, and there will be no objections allowed. She also invites Alicia to join them, and she agrees instantly. Albert makes a face, so Merida asks him if he does not want this. Of course, he has probably been wanting this from the moment he was born, but he wants to know if Alicia is fine with it. The maid girl says that she wants to devote everything to her lord, so it is finally decided and she is shocked that someone as young as Albert is so good when it comes to the f He tells her that he is a priest after all, and has knowledge about everything. There's also the fact that he has the knowledge he gained from his previous life as well. Merida does not agree with this, as she was thoroughly violated. 
so now she wants to return the favor in round two. Albert will not give in so easily, which is why he says he needs some answers first. He confirms that Merida kidnapped him because she needed him for the Alancia Empire, and then asks why she was banished to the enemy country of Alexa. It turns out that Merida had almost ended the fiancé who was recommended to her by the Demon King. Albert is shocked to learn this, but Merida states that she did not like the way her fiancé looked, so she could not help her violent tendencies. Basically, he tried to touch her and she punched him really hard as a reflex action, which was more than enough to knock him out. Due to this, the head of the Irwin family, Merida's uncle got angry and banished her to Alexa. Albert is still trying to wrap his head around this, but Merida flexes that the Demon King and she were like real siblings as they were brought up together. He might have tried to arrange her marriage with noble intentions, but he did not know her preferences, which led to this situation. This is enough information for our hero as he now knows that Merida has a special connection with the Demon King, which means that the Irwin group is indeed as strong as the rumor suggested. This is enough for him to proceed with his initial plan. He goes on to ask Merida if she knows any trusted Imperial noble who can mediate with the Demon King. She says that her sister's husband is a margrave called Stefan, but she is not sure what plan Albert has in mind. He goes on to whisper his plan into the demon girl's ears, and this is more than enough to convince her that he is on the right track. She calls it a wonderful plan and wishes to start the preparations immediately. In order to do that, Albert will need to write a letter, but there is something else on Merida's mind. He asks her what the issue is, and she says that she has decided something very important. Since she likes him so much, Merida wants our hero to support her as her husband, which is a pretty big step after just one session of shady activities. Albert is not too sure about this, because being the demon warrior's husband would be a bold step. However, Merida thinks that they are a perfect match for each other. She does have one condition though, which is that she wishes to have as many mistresses as she desires. This is a bit of a shock to our hero, because he was definitely not expecting such a request. Merida can't stop her intrusive thoughts when it comes to cute girls, so she needs to be with them whenever she wishes to. As far as men are concerned, she only needs Albert since he knows how to ring her bell in more ways than one. Basically, Merida is the female equivalent of a man of culture, as she cannot control herself around beautiful women. If this isn't good enough for him, then Merida also says that they can share these women with each other. It's probably the most generous thing any wife can offer her husband. So Albert asks her if she is sure about this. Merida says that she would never lie about such things, and they will only get freaky if these other girls are fine with it. Now, Albert has to show us that he's a serious hero, so he thinks about the benefits of this deal apart from the very obvious ones. As Merida's husband, he will be able to command a lot more authority as compared to being her subordinate, so that's also a bonus. If he can help the demon warrior girl return to her empire, then his grand plan will definitely be achieved. And yes, he finally admits that he adores Merida, and with all the access he'll get to curvy babes after their marriage, only a fool would say no. Albert then tells the demon princess that he will be more than happy to become her husband and offer his support. She is glad that he has made the right decision, and then even Alicia says that she can be of service to both Merida as well as her master Albert. It looks like the couple have already started building their harem, but as of now, both Merida and Alicia want to dominate Albert after all the unspeakable things he did to them in round one. Our hero currently has post-walnut clarity, so he asks the girls to control their hormones at least till he finishes the letter. However, they do not listen to him, and it can be safely assumed that our hero won round two as well. One week later, Albert receives a reply to the letter he sent after round two, 
and this prompts him to ask Merida to round up all their mercenaries. The preparations are complete, and our hero is raring to go now. We can see that the mercenaries are a rough bunch, so it is to be seen whether Albert can handle them or not. One of these fighters tells Albert that he looks like he's had a lot of fun the previous night. This should not come as a surprise to anyone, considering how skilled our hero is. But the fighter says that he's super jealous of Albert for living the dream life. Our hero simply asks if the fighters could hear him, his wife, and their mistress in bed, to which they say yes. He then jokes that Merida could not stop coming back for more, and even Alicia is quite the animal in bed. This is enough to get all the men laughing, although the maid girl is a bit embarrassed that her true desires have been leaked out in public. The mercenaries say that their Lord Albert is the only man who has been able to tame the demon princess, and they respect him for that, which means he has them under control. Of course, Merida does not appreciate being made fun of, so she scolds her men and says that Albert might be a lewd man, but he's also extremely smart. They apologize to her, but state that it's really hard for them to imagine someone like Merida to have fallen so hard for a human. Albert is just glad that these men don't hate him, and then he tells us that the bonds these mercenaries share is quite unique, probably due to Merida's charm. We see the demon princess knocking down a couple of her fighters out of shyness, but it's time to get down to business. The mercenaries ask if they will actually be able to return to Alancia if this plan works out, to which our hero shows proof of his concept. It's an approval by none other than the demon king himself, which he was able to get thanks to Stefan mediating for him. Basically, they will need to take both the heads and territories of the three border lords on the side of Alexa. One of the mercenaries asks if it is as easy as it sounds, because the border lords would oppose the empire if they noticed this happening. Albert says that this would be probably if it were the imperial army led by the demon king. However, they are simply a group of mercenaries on the field, so if they can destroy the Lord's forces and allow the Imperial Army to take over their castles, then no one will be in a position to complain. It's time for us to go into some battle strategy now, as we learn that the three Lords in question are of Zura, Zaisan, and Benia. These Lords are known for looting their people with taxes and also engaging in slave trade so they aren't exactly angels from heaven. These lords also switch sides and betray others during war, so they are shunned even by the people of Alexa. Basically, getting rid of them is something that only the Irwin mercenary group will be able to do, and once this is achieved, then Merida can reclaim her status in her land. Albert's words rile up the soldiers, and they are now prepared to fight for their princess in order to restore her former glory. With that, Merida rides her horse and sets off with Albert and Alicia following after in the carriage. It's a rather interesting situation that our hero has found himself in, as he was once known as the treasure of wisdom in Alexa, but now he has turned the tables and sided with the demons to work with his demon wife. Now, we move to the Lord of Benia and his territory castle which gets invaded by Merida and her men. The demon princess announces herself and states that she will be seizing the castle now. But of course, the knights say that they won't give in to bandits. Merida doesn't have time for false optimism, so she decides to slash the gates with her giant sword. She takes them down with ease, but even then, the delusional soldiers think that they will be safe from her if they stay in their current zone. However, these knights get smashed to a whole other level by the mercenaries, who spare no mercy at all in their attacks. Merida smiles cutely while saying she will destroy this castle and end everyone who is inside it right now. One of her men asks her if this really is the wise way to go, and it makes her realize that she is being a bit too extreme. Now, we move to a flashback a few days ago at the mercenary camp where our hero is explaining to his demon wife three very important rules that she will need to follow. 
The first rule is that she can't end any unarmed citizens. The second rule is that she should avoid any unnecessary property damage. And the final rule is that there will be no looting. The money from this raid will be distributed to all the common folk of the area. But Merida does not want to do something like this. She feels that looting and violence are all a part of war. But Albert says that her return to her empire will be impossible if she follows such vicious methods. The demon princess says that it will be difficult to get the others to follow these rules, as it's part of their nature to be violent. Our hero tells her that this time, the castle and all its inhabitants will be a gift to the demon king. He then asks Merida if she would be happy to receive a broken gift, and it then makes sense to her. She still finds it difficult to accept, so Albert pulls out his ultimate trump card. He says that, in addition to never being able to go back to her empire, Merida will also no longer receive his nighttime duties. This makes her upset because she craves for Albert's elephant, so she decides to follow his rules. Back to the present, she tells all her men to make sure they don't break any of Albert's rules. Otherwise, she will deal with them personally. The men do as their princess says, and they continue their assault in full flow. A lot of the knights drop their weapons and surrender, so Merida decides to spare their lives for now. Of course, if there is anyone who tries to resist, then there is only one option, which is to chop them down. The demon princess sets the example herself as she slashes her way through all the knights in impressive fashion. She is happy to see that some of the knights are still fighting, because it will satisfy her desire to end them. The problem for her, though, is that everyone over here is a weakling. Suddenly, a giant nightman shows up and tells Merida that she has been lucky to make it this far. He introduces himself as Bazam, the bear of the frontier, and he claims that he will be her demise. He feels that Merida has no chance against him, and even the soldiers behind him ask the bear to take it slow with her. He raises his sword and prepares to swing it hard as he believes he is going to slice the demon princess in half. However, she is able to block his attack with ease and even manages to smile at him without flinching. As expected, Bazam is in shock because he thought this attack would be more than enough to finish his opponent. She then proceeds to slash through his axe and then through his body. Bazam begs for mercy towards the end, but it is of no use as she slashes him into half with minimum effort. Merida laments that this bear was not even good enough to be considered a warm-up, and this display is good enough to get all the remaining knights to surrender. With that, the conquering of this castle is almost complete as the ones who have surrendered their weapons have been rounded up in the square. The only people left are the Lord and his family, who are barricaded inside the manor. Merida reaches the scene where we see the Lord getting served by his slaves. She breaks down the door abruptly to shock everyone, and the Lord asks who she is. Merida states that she will be seizing his castle from him, and her sword makes him panic like a little baby. He begs for mercy and even holds on to Merida's leg like a dog in heat. However, the demon princess does not like filth on her curvy body, so she kicks the Lord away in an instant. She says that she can't control her natural instinct to kick a fat, bald man and states that she will be taking his head now. The Lord gets furious and says that even if he has lost his castle, the forces at Zaisan and Zura will surely come for revenge. Merida simply smiles at his claims and says that she doubts such a thing would happen, especially because those castles have also fallen. She says that her darling husband is so good at strategy that he has already started the cleanup, and he will be here soon. Just as she says this, our hero shows up to confirm that the other castles have indeed fallen. Merida proudly shows him all the prisoners and valuables that she has collected so far, in order to impress him. 
Albert thanks her for her efforts and says that it's time for her to give a big speech now. She does not want to do it as she is shy, but her husband reminds her that it is necessary for the restoration of her reputation. She puts on a big, fake smile, and then she addresses the citizens of Benia. She says that they have finally been freed of the Lord who exploited them for so long, and it is all because of the Irwin mercenary group. She adds that all the wealth accumulated from this raid will be distributed amongst the common folk, as it is the wish of the Demon King. She then says that this area will now be governed by the Imperial Army, which means that it will be handled justly and without bias. Albert prompts everyone to cheer for the Demon King, which they do in unison. As everyone applauds Merida, the real mastermind of the plan, Albert comments on how he was able to turn so many people into Imperial Loyalists without any cost to the Empire. They collect the wages for the soldiers, and the people of the land are simply happy to be given back the money that was taken from them. Now that the funds for governing the town are ready, our hero comments on how convenient the Irwin group has turned out to be for him, especially his demon wife who is essentially like a cheat code with all the skills she has been blessed with. Now, it's Albert's turn to clean up after all the muscle heads put in the work. The same practices are used for the other two territories as well, and then we move forward one week. The Alancia Imperial Garrison can be seen in action, as our hero and his team greet the Demon Lord's Messenger. They are happy to see Margrave Stefan who looks like the human version of Nine Tails, and is also glad to see Merida once again in person. Albert can check out his stats, all of which are extremely impressive, especially his intelligence and leadership. Stefan tells Merida that her sister Lia is also joyous to hear about her return. But the demon princess says that all of this is because of her husband. Stefan takes a look at our hero and examines him while he tries to make an introduction. Stefan is surprised by Albert's stature, because he does not look like an alpha male. Plus, after what Merida did to the fiancé chosen for her, it's even more surprising to see she has chosen Albert for herself. Our hero takes his time to assess Stefan, because his stats are not just impressive, but also consistent. Stefan might have a friendly demeanor, but he does look like he's trying to work things out, which can be intimidating for a man like Albert. Merida tells her brother-in-law that Albert is amazing, and his plan has led to all the liberated citizens becoming imperial territory. Stefan agrees that he could see a lot of happy locals on his way to meet the team over here, and he is also impressed to see how the surrounding areas are recovering from the bandit onslaughts. Stefan is so taken away by such a great strategy that he admits even he would not have been able to come up with it. He then asks Albert to come work for him, which obviously annoys Merida. Our hero does not know how to respond to this, but his demon wife does, so she tells Stefan to stay away from her husband. She does not care if he is her sister's husband, because Albert is way too valuable for her. Stefan simply says that he was joking around and then our hero lauds him for being capable enough to push people to their limits. At the same time, he says that he is glad to be supporting such a curvy wife. With her, he can relax as much as he wants, but then he learns something rather troubling. Stefan says that Lord Preston will need to be persuaded by none other than Albert, which Merida agrees to. Our hero does not like the sound of this, because Lord Preston is not exactly the calmest man on the planet. He is the head of the Irwin family and also Merida's uncle who was extremely upset because of her attacking her fiancé. The demon princess says that Lord Preston currently rules over Ash Ray, which used to be her territory. In order for her to return to her nobility, she will need to take Ash Ray back. However, this is a lot easier said than done because Lord Preston is known as the Crimson Spear Demon on the battlefield. Merida adds that another one of his nicknames happens to be the Mad Dog of Irwin, which was given to him by his own allies. 
Even she does not stand a chance against him. And then Stefan says that Lord Preston has actually given the Demon King a run for his money as well. He also jokes that as long as they have the strategist Albert on their side, it should not be an issue to persuade Lord Preston. Our hero figures that this was the main plan all along, and he has been somewhat played. Merida realizes that she had hidden this from her husband, so she promises that if he is able to persuade her uncle, then she will put on certain attire that Albert wishes to see her in. It's embarrassing for her to say this, but Albert jokes that his dream is to live with his beautiful wife, have his own territory, and be surrounded by even more cute and curvy girls. Merida is getting teased a lot, so Albert eventually agrees to act as an envoy and convince Lord Preston to give her back Ash Ray. Merida can now breathe a sigh of relief, but she ends up suffocating her husband with her own massive pillows in the process. It's actually not a bad way to go, but there's more to this story, so we carry on. Meanwhile, at the Orgis residence in Alexa, we can see that the mood is very different. Prince Orgis is furious because of how our hero has bested him in the most discreet manner possible. His followers ask him what's the matter, and he says that it's all because of the young priest. The followers are shocked because Orgis reveals the king will soon find out about their rackets if things continue the way they currently are going. Basically, while all of this was going on with the three lords, Albert also made sure to send a letter to the king, accusing Orgis and his men of their atrocious crimes. The reason they could not pick up on this one was because it was addressed to Orgis' brother and not him. The brother, Gorin, is actually second in line to the throne, so it could mess things up for Orgis if he were to be favored after the scandal breaks out. Orgis says that they will need to act fast before Gorin goes ahead and informs their father about this. The followers say that they will head back to their territories and dispose of any evidence that may implicate them. However, Orgis calls them fools because their territories have already been seized. The followers are shocked to hear this, but Orgis has realized that these attacks have a lot to do with Merida and her gang as well. The prince says that his followers are just a liability now and will be dealt with accordingly. At that very moment, some knights show up and hold knives to the necks of his followers. They plead for mercy, but it's of no use as Orgis orders his guards to lay all the blame of his racket onto his followers. He believes he has gotten himself out of a pickle now, but he will still need to lay low for a while because of Albert. He then decides to put a bounty on Albert and he promises not to leave our hero alive. Now, we move back to Merida who is having an intense session with Alicia that cannot be described by innocent words. Alicia has been put under strict orders from her Lord Albert to treat Merida's kitty nicely. She then looks Merida in the eye and asks her not to forget her favorite maid girl while she's away. For now, she will continue to treat Merida's kitty to the best of her ability. Meanwhile, Albert has found his way into Lord Preston's castle and he bows down to greet him. Preston refers to our hero as the child who claims to be the husband of that foolish girl. Preston then tells Albert that he not only managed to deceive the demon princess into becoming his wife, he also snuck her back into the Empire and now wishes to relieve the Crimson Spear demon of his duties. Albert confirms all of this, but states that he also has something which he would like to discuss with his demon wife's uncle. Our hero tries to stand up, but it's of no use as Preston tells him to stay where he is, and even proceeds to threaten him with his spear. He was so fast that Albert couldn't even see him movie, which is why he needs to be careful moving forward. Our hero then says that if Preston allows him to assume command, then he will raise the Irwin family to the highest level of nobility. Of course, Preston thinks that these are just fancy words, and he does not trust such a skinny human to accomplish anything. Albert instantly responds by saying he will be able to curb Merida's wild streak. Next, he will also take care of all the domestic, 
foreign and intelligence affairs of the territory. Basically, this will free Preston from the troubles of running an empire all by himself. If Albert were to assume control, then both Lord Preston and Merida will be able to keep their focus firmly on the battlefield and nowhere else. Our hero wishes to turn them into the greatest generals this world has ever known, and this makes Preston pause for a moment. He eventually grins and says that he would not expect anything less from the man who was able to tame Merida. It's exactly what he needs as well, because he is sick and tired of having to do managerial work. Being a lord does not suit him at all, and he is much better off fighting the enemy. Lord Preston ends the chat by saying if Albert is able to keep Merida in check, then he will be more than happy to surrender his spot to him. Albert says he can stake his life on it, and now the men can shift to a more casual tone of conversation. Preston asks our hero what he thinks of his crazy demon wife because she is a selfish girl in general. However, she has a lot of potential, and Preston does not want to see it go to waste. Albert needs more context, so he asks if Merida is hated within the Empire, to which Preston says that every single retainer hates her. After all, the demon princess is like a goddess of war, but it's her curvy body that makes all the men go soft on her, but not in a biological way. Since Preston is her uncle, he is the only one who is strict with her, but he hopes this will end now with Albert taking over. Our hero humbly accepts his new challenge, and Lord Preston says it's time to celebrate a new era. He has already sent a very fast horse to go collect Merida, so it won't be long before she gets here. Albert is surprised to hear this, but the party is just getting started. A little while later, we can see our hero dining with his wife while all the other royal subjects are also enjoying a feast. Merida wants more booze because her husband's cup is empty, but maybe she is the one who needs to take it easy for now. Albert says that he might be at his limit, but Lord Preston is not going to go easy on him at all. He pours more sake for Albert, and then we see a curvy babe approaching him. She is glad to see the man who was able to steal Merida's heart, and with her is a flat woman who wonders how such a skinny man could land a babe like Merida. Albert does not know who these women are, so Preston introduces them as his wife Freya and in a shocking twist, his son, Rator. Rator is actually a man who looks and exhibits the sass of a girl, but Albert is not here to judge anyone, so he thanks both Freya and Rator for their hospitality. Rator tells him not to address him with so much respect, because they are pretty much the same age. Now that the alcohol is flowing, it's time to get started, but our hero wonders what else is there to start other than the end. Merida seems to know what's going on, and Rator states that it's time for the Demon Tribe Strength competition to begin. The star of the show today is none other than our hero Albert, although he has no idea what he is getting dragged into right now. He panics and says that he was not told about any kind of strength competition, so he is not prepared for it at all. Rator says that anyone who gets married into the demon tribe gets to choose the kind of fight they would like to get into, so it's not like Albert is being forced into something that is out of his league. Basically, it's all a part of tradition for the demon tribe to show strength in conflict, but Albert is not too sure about this, so he turns to Merida to ask her for confirmation. She tells him not to worry about it, as it is just a formality and he will not be ended. Essentially, the demon tribe values strength over everything else, so this kind of tradition is important to them. Of course, there has to be a downside to this, so Albert asks what will happen if he is not able to win with his strength. Merida states that it means nobody will ever listen to him, and while she says it casually, the overall impact is actually quite serious for our hero. As a military strategist, this could be the difference between life and death for him. But the demon princess smiles away and says that she already knows how amazing her husband is. She says that even if Albert were to lose, 
she will find a way to convince everyone of how great he is. This is not at all reassuring for our hero, but Rator does not have all day to waste over here. He wants Albert to choose his preferred type of battle right now, so he decides to use his big brain energy. After confirming that he can choose literally any kind of battle format, Albert comes up with a fight that he will be sure to win, no matter what may happen. We then see a sheet of paper being presented to the participants, but Rator has no idea what's going on. Alicia the maid is serving the papers to everyone because Albert is engaging in a writing contest with Rator. The feminine son has his doubts, but Albert states once again that he could choose whatever format he desired. The pen is the way for him in multiple aspects of life, so it was only appropriate for him to choose this contest. Merida shouts that demons do not tell lies, so they have to accept her husband's challenge, no matter what. However, she wants to know why she is also being made to be part of this, but then she gets taunted for being a quitter. This spurs her on, and she tells Lord Preston that there is no way the demons will shy away from a writing contest. We can see even Preston having difficulties, but he is not the type to turn away from a challenge, so he does what he can. Rator, on the other hand, is holding pens as if they are chopsticks, and can't understand why his hands are trembling. Alicia does her thing in her maid outfit to win all our hearts, and she also flashes the sign with the topic for everyone to write on. All the demons face a really uphill challenge as they are not able to command the pen the same way as they command a sword. This is quite strange because normally, the demon tribe is excellent when it comes to drawing out maps and other such items. However, when they get presented with something out of the norm, it's almost as if they have been asked to do the impossible. Alicia turns the contest into a reality show as she announces the updates one after the other, while the remaining demons watch on in anticipation. It looks like Albert has taken the lead and he is completing his tasks with ease, whereas his competition is dropping out of the race. Merida can't take this anymore, and she apologizes to Albert for making him deal with Lord Preston. It's become so tough for her that she feels as if the walls are closing in on her. Even the great Lord Preston himself is admitting defeat as he feels like he is losing his sense of vision. By the end of it all, we see the demons fallen on the ground having quite evidently lost, while Albert emerges as the unanimous victor. After claiming such a generous victory, Albert decided to win over the entire demon tribe by writing quotes for them. He ends up providing a ridiculous amount of 700 quotes all within an hour. It's great to see our hero dominating demons with the power of his mind, and later, we see Rator scolding his dad for being a useless old man. Preston is not going to just stand there and take the insults, so he fires one back at his son. As they continue to fight, they hear someone coming in, and they ask what's the matter. It's just Albert, who looks like even he is enjoying the high spirits. Rator starts to blame his father for something, and Preston fires the same accusation back at his son. Albert does not care about who started the whole thing, as fighting within the castle is forbidden. It is also quite dangerous for someone like Preston to be fighting his own blood in the castle. Both Rator and Preston have realized that they are going to be punished for this, so they beg Albert not to send them to the personal reflection room. Basically, this room was made as part of the several rules and regulations Albert had come up with to rule his new empire. Anyone who broke the rules, such as fighting within the castle, would be sent to this room, no matter who they were. The personal reflection room has no windows, and the people sent their need to sit upright and write the words, I will act thoughtfully. This is actually no big deal for a normal human, but when it came to the demons, they feared this greatly. Now, both father and son continue to ask for mercy, so our hero tells Preston to repair the wall and Rator to go and help tend to the farm. Both the demon men listen to him like loyal puppies, 
and it pleases Albert as he has made this tribe succumb to his rules, even though they are known for their strength. The next thing on Albert's wish list is the territory management plan. Basically, this is his method of utilizing Ashray Castle as a trade hub to make money. Not only do merchants pass by this castle a lot, there is an extremely fertile grain land up north as well. The castle is also a critical defense point, which is why the Irwin family was given this section even though they are technically a low-ranking bunch. After all, no one can match them when it comes to their combat abilities. Usually, in times of peace, this is a very easy area to manage, which is why our hero took up the management job instantly. However, there was no system in place to manage the finances of the castle. As a matter of fact, Preston doesn't even know what a revenue tax ledger is. Albert prays that Preston has kept these documents somewhere because he has been managing this area up till now. It turns out that the Crimson Spear Demon would simply allow the village chief and the merchants to store things in the safes and warehouses as they pleased. By doing this, he was allowed to collect taxes during wars if there was a shortage. Albert looks worried, but then Preston hands over some documents to him. At first, our hero is happy as he believes these are ledgers. However, it only turns out to be an inventory list of military supplies. Albert quickly figures that he should not have expected any kind of admin skills from the demon tribe, and he will need to prepare the books all by himself. He asks for the treasury, and Preston says it's in the central underground section of the castle. He does mention that due to the lavish party they had earlier and other expenses this year, the supply may be low. Albert says that there was the reward for capturing the frontier towns, so there's no need to worry about finances. Our heads to the treasury and gets it opened up by the guards. But to his shock and dismay, it is absolutely empty. Things are most definitely not going as our hero would have wanted, so he will need to improvise now. Later in the castle, we see Merida using all of her demon skills to stamp a piece of paper. She asks her hubby how she did, and he takes a look. He notices that the stamp is a little crooked, but it will do for now. The demon princess is glad to hear this, so she asks if she can go train now, but Albert tells her that she will need to come back again tomorrow to stamp some more papers. Merida does not like the sound of this, so she asks Albert why she is needed if he had said he would handle all of the paperwork. He explains that stamping the seals is the duty of the head of the castle, which is a law. Our hero has no interest in getting arrested, so Merida will need to do as he says. There are mountains of sheets to go through, and talk about all of this only makes the demon princess a lot more anxious. She scolds Albert for always making her do things that make her suffer. But he jokes by saying it's the highlight of his day to see her this way. Merida also teases him a bit before leaving the room to go for training. Our hero tells his demon wife to be home before dinner. And then Alicia comes in to serve some tea. The maid girl comments that her mistress Merida has a very alluring face and Albert knows exactly what she means by this. Now, Alicia asks her master how the financial situation is of the castle, and he says that the treasury is empty, but that's not all. The castle actually owes 49,000 gold coins as well, which is a massive sum of money. Alicia wants to know what has caused this mess, and our hero responds by saying it's all due to sloppy management and a whole bunch of useless retainers. To understand this further, he explains how a baron's household usually has around 50 people. In the case of the Irwin household, there is a ridiculous number of 200 people. Nearly all of these people are military staff who are paid anywhere between 3 gold coins to 15 gold coins per month, based on their position. The problem is that most of these people are actually needed to protect the locations near the castle. This territory was given to them in order to maintain proximity, but it's still a huge financial hole. 
Luckily, they now have 5,000 gold coins from their earlier frontier mission, so there is some cash in the castle. Albert knows that he will have to run a tight ship when it comes to managing the financial affairs of this land. However, this is going to be so exhausting that he might just collapse from all the work he will need to put in. Alicia feels bad for her master and wishes that she could be of more use to him, but he says that she is already doing a fine job in forming an information network. After getting done with some paperwork, our hero visits the castle's food warehouse and is shocked to see the amount of food on display. The warehouse manager says that they have such a strong supply because there have not been any wars recently. It is due to this excess supply that some of the food items have already started to spoil, which means that something will need to be done immediately to avoid wastage. Albert asks this man if he is the only one managing this warehouse, and he says that he has been entrusted with this supply by the various village chiefs. The demon tribe only uses this stock in times of need, but there has to be a better way to use it. Albert brings out his stat bar and notices this man's name is Melvis. His admin skills are through the roof, so he feels that Melvis is being wasted in the warehouse. Albert asks him what he feels should be the top priority for the Elwyn household, but he is hesitant to answer because of his standing. Albert tells him to speak freely, so Melvis states that the main priority should be to maintain the ledgers. Reducing wastage would also be great, because this is a rich territory and can be used to the Elwyn family's advantage. Our hero is glad to see that he and Melvis are on the same page, so he asks him if he would like to become the administrator of the Elwyn family. Melvis is honored to be presented with such an opportunity, but he does not know if he should take up a role as important with this one. Albert reassures him that he has control over the all the internal affairs, so approvals won't be hard to come by. He also offers to pay Melvis an additional salary as admin on top of what he is making as a warehouse manager. Melvis can't believe he will have the chance to make so much money, but Albert reminds him that the work will not be easy at all. Melvis understands the assignment and bows down to our hero as his new underling. Now, Albert asks him if he has any buyers for all the useless stock they have in the warehouse. He says that he will contact all of the merchants in town as soon as possible, but he will need the pricing of the stock as well. Albert says he will give him the pricing tomorrow itself, which is actually hard to believe for Melvis. Albert admits that one day to transport all the items in the warehouse might seem impossible, but he does have a plan in mind. The next day, we see Alicia in her cute maid outfit getting the demon tribe ready for their latest task. The idea is to have all the demons transport the goods out of the warehouse, and whoever does it the fastest will get to be the vanguard in the next battle. This pumps all of them, especially Merida, Preston, and Rator. Albert manages to arrange the destinations as per colored cloth, so that he will be able to distinguish the stock as well. The demons are told not to mix up the colors, otherwise Merida will deal them accordingly, so they carry out their tasks perfectly. Melvis can't believe that our hero has managed to clear out the warehouse by simply using the guise of training. Rator thinks that his squad is in the lead, but he is shocked to see how far ahead Preston and Merida are. The demons remain competitive as each of them believes they have won, but Alicia tells everyone to relax with some food and drinks till they finish counting the boxes. Melvis is still in disbelief over what he has just seen, but there is no time to waste so Albert tells him to begin his part of the job and bring the merchants over now to check the stock. Albert has done a great job in emptying the warehouse in just half a day, and he might look to get a big reward from Merida as well as Alicia later in the night. What else does he intend to do with his new demon empire? And when is our hero going to meet with the demon lord himself? Like, share, and subscribe if you also have intrusive thoughts and want the story to continue.
Get this video to 50k views and part 2 will definitely be made. Okay then, I'll see you in the next one.